Good evening. This is Pastor Tony Collins from the House of Worship in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And I have one question for you tonight. Do you know what time it is? No, I'm not, I don't mean the clock, and you can look at your clock and tell what time it is based on that. No. Do you know what time it is spiritually? You know what's going on around you? And I want you to know the answer to that question. What time is it? It's war time. I want you to know that you're in a battle. You're in a war. You're in a fight for your spiritual life. You're in a fight for the spiritual lives of those that are around you, for those that you love. It's war time. The question is, are you ready for the battle? The question is, are you ready to go to war that you might have everything that God wants you to have? The Word of God says that since the days of John the Baptist, that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, it suffers violence. And violent men, violent women, violent children of God, we take by force, fighting spiritually those things that God has, that God has prepared for us. Are you ready? ready for war. Let's go in and check out the message. I'll be back in just a few moments. Today I want to talk to you about warfare. And uh, I want to start by telling you, uh, this is a true story of, of, of a, a Japanese um, war camp, if you will. And in this war camp, um, there were Americans, there were Scottish people, there were, there were British people. And the, I don't know anything about the bridge over um, the, the river Kauai, but it was built um, by a lot of different uh, nationalities, if you will. And particularly, it was about this one guy, and his name was Angus McGillivray. We're just going to call him Angus. You okay with that? And so anyway, long story short, um, basically um, in this camp, um, it kind of had disintegrated. So you have the, the Japanese who are the overseers, they're, they're the enemy, and um, they have these Americans, they have the Brits, and they have the Scottish, and as you can imagine, they all kind of, all the Americans kind of go together, all the Brits kind of go together, and all the Scottish people kind of go together. And this thing had really become, become dog eat dog in, inside this concentration camp. And uh, people were stealing from each other, uh, which is crazy, right? I mean, here they are all in, in incarcerated together, and instead of helping each other, they're, they're stealing from each other. They're cheating um, each other. Uh, and the law of the jungle, if you will, had kind of, uh, had kind of prevailed uh, until this guy Angus died. And his death, the rumor of his death went throughout the camp. And it wasn't so much that Angus had died, but it was how Angus had died. And um, because nobody could believe that he had succumbed. He was a big strapping guy, and they figured if anybody was going to make it to the end of this camp, it was going to be Angus. Uh, but Angus died unexpectedly. Uh, the story behind Angus' death is that um, Angus was one of those guys, the Scot he was Scottish, and the Scottish people just really believed they had a, they have a mate. They would kind of like connect people up. And they would say, you know, this guy's responsible for your life, and you're responsible for, for, for his life. And Angus really, he, he really took that seriously. And his mate, his guy that he had been connected with, he was, he was dying. And Angus knew that he was dying, and everybody in the camp knew that he was dying, and everybody was expecting him to die except Angus. Angus made up in his mind that no matter what happened, he was not going to allow his friend to die. And so one day he brought his friend a blanket because his friend was sick and he was cold. And he brought his friend a, bl his bl a blanket and his friend said, hey, Angus, you can't give me your blanket. He says, Angus says, no, no, no. He said, I found another blanket. And his friend was needed more food. They gave you a little bit of rations. And uh, Angus would bring his rations and give them to his friend. And his friend would say, Angus, I can't eat your food. I can't eat your rations, Angus. And he said, no, no, no. I, I, I got some, some more rations. So go, go ahead and, and, and eat, eat my, 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 my rations. And so as Angus's mate was beginning to recover and everyone could see that this guy, he was going to live, as this was going on, Angus collapsed, slumped over, and died. And it turned out that Angus had died of starvation. He had died of starvation that was complicated by exhaustion. Or in other words, Angus had given to his mate, in essence, everything that he had. He had given him his blanket, he had given him his food, and in essence, he had given him his very life. 
the ramifications of Angus's love for his mate. His unselfishness had an unusual and startling effect on the compound. The word circulated that Angus had died. He had died by sacrificing his life for his friend. He had given up his rations, his blanket. And he had taken care of his friend to the point of death. And the feel of the camp began to change. It moved from dog eat dog. It moved from the jungle uh, the atmosphere to men and women beginning to focus not on themselves, but on their mates. They begin to focus on not so much the, the, the war environment, but on their, the humanity. They began living beyond just survival. They began giving oneself away. They began to pool their talents. One was a violin maker, another was an orchestra leader, another a, a cabinet maker, another a professor. Soon the camp had an orchestra full of homemade instruments in a church called the Church Without Walls that was so powerful, so compelling, that even the Japanese guards attended. The men started a university, a hospital, a library system. The place, the entire camp was completely and totally transformed and this love that had been smothered out seemingly was revived. And as a result, what happened is an awesome illustration of the potential unleash when one person will give it all away. Today, the Holy Spirit wants to talk to you about preparing for war. Preparing for war. If you don't mind standing on your feet and grabbing your Bibles, we do that here at the House of Worship in Oak Ridge at this campus at our 10 o'clock service and turning with me to Judges the third chapter. We're going to talk about war. We're not talking about fighting, but we're talking about war because there's a difference between fighting, being in a fight, and being in a war. Being in a fight, you know, you, you, you throw a couple of, th couple of shots and knock somebody down and you walk away and the whole thing's kind of said and done. You may not like them ever again, but you, it, it's, it, we just had a fight. But a war is when someone wants to kill you. They want to kill you, they want to kill everybody that you love, and they want to take all that you have. They want to take what you have now, they want to take what you have in the future, they want to take your destiny, they want to take your eternity, if they could, and they want to make it theirs. I'm talking about preparing for war. Judges, the third chapter, beginning at verse 1. Now, these are the nations which the Lord left. Somebody say left to test Israel by them, that is, all who had not experienced any of the wars of Canaan, only in order that the generations of the sons of Israel might be taught war. Those who had not experienced it formerly, these nations are, these are the nations that God left to teach those who had not been taught war how to war. These nations are the five lords of the Philistines. And all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites who lived in, lived in Mount Lebanon, from Mount Baal Harriman as far as Lebo Hamath. And they were for testing Israel to find out if they would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he had commanded their fathers through Moses. And the sons of Israel lived among the Canaanites. And the sons of Israel lived among the Canaanites, the, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, and they took their daughters for themselves as wives and gave the, their own daughters to their sons and served their gods. And the sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and forgot the Lord their God and forgot the Lord their God and forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherah. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel so that he sold them into the hands of the king of Syria and the sons of Israel served the king of Syria eight years. And when the sons of Israel cried to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the sons of Israel to deliver them 
Othniel, the son of Kenaz, God, uh, Caleb's younger brother. And the spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Israel. When he went out to war, the Lord gave the king of Syria into his hand so that he prevailed over the king of Syria. Then the land had rest 40 years, and Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. You may be seated in the house of God. I want you to help me preach this message today. Will you help me today? I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you what time it is. And the appropriate response is going to be wartime. Are you ready? Are you ready? What time is it? What time is it? What time is it? Who are we talking about and what do we see here in this scripture? These are the sons, the seed of Abraham. These are the, the, the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is their seed. These are the ones that were enslaved in Egypt that have been brought out. They have been brought out and brought into the promised land. They have had in the history of the nation of Israel, from the time they left Egypt up till now, they have had many, many victories. But they have not finished their mission. They have not finished their commandments of God. We told them, in essence, to, to go into the land, be fruitful and multiply, rule over it, and subdue it. For we see in this scripture that Ashdod remains. We see in this scripture that Gaza and Ashkelon, that Gad and Ekron, the five lords of Philistine, Felicia, they still remain. We find here in this scripture that the Sidonians are on the coast and the Hivites, they are up in the mountains in Mount Lebanon, that the enemy still remains. Not only this, but everywhere in the country were some scatterings of these previous nations. The cause of Israel's blatant disregard of God's word and many tolerances and indulgences, there were so many, there were so many uh, indulgences, there were so many tolerances of the current culture, that so many were made that it was easy for Canaan to be insolent, to be rude, to be disrespectful to their God. That it is said that the Israelites dwelled among the Canaanites as if the power and authority still remained in Canaan. It is God's divine justice he allows the Canaanites to remain. Israel has not obeyed. Israel has not fulfilled their mission. And so opposition remains. Also, we see God's wisdom is revealed as the country is so rich and abundant. You know, it's a land that's flowing with milk and honey. And God's desire is to, is to bless his people is so great that they are even now exceedingly rich and abundant in every way. If left to their own devices, they would sink into the depth of luxury and self-indulgence. Instead, they must be able to defend their coast. They must be able to take the mountains and expand on the plains. If they are to please God and walk in the fullness of his abundance, they are in need of a military discipline and a military attitude. They need to learn the art of war. It is to their benefit to breed warriors, to constantly prepare for what it is that is inevitable. Hmm? I want to tell you today, House of Worship Church family, as we look at this scripture, we can open our mouths in, in, in awe of what's going on here. But I came to tell, tell you today that this is a picture of the modern day church. Hmm? 
that we are in the spirit those who have been brought out of Egypt. We are the ones who are walking in the, the, the blessings of God. We have found our way into the promised land. If nowhere else, surely here in the United States of America, but I want you to know today that we have not fulfilled our mission. We have not completed our task for still there is an enemy that remains. I want you to know today that everywhere you look in, in our lives and in your life and in my life, we find the re remnants of the culture where God has delivered us out of. I want you to know today in the name of Jesus Christ, I wish it wasn't true, but even in the church, America, there are so many, in, so many tolerances and so many indulgencies of the culture of this world that it makes it easy for this culture to be rude and disrespectful to our God. I came to tell you today in the name of Jesus Christ that in your life and in my life, there's still, there's an enemy that remains. What time is it? In the name of Jesus Christ, I came by here to say to you today that we have got a task that must be fulfilled. That God wants to bless you and he has blessed you. And even now as you look and survey your life and look around the world, you would have to admit no matter how you see yourself relative to America, that relative to the world, you are walking in, in abundance. You are blessed and you are blessed indeed. Uh, we are hereby exhorted because of the situation that we find ourselves in to stay on guard, to keep on the full armor of God, Always preparing for war. What time is it? Just three things today, and then we're going to go home. First thing is the word left. L-E-F-T as in God left opposition in the land for the Israelites. God left the opposition, and the purpose of the opposition was a test. It was left in the land to test those who had never been part formerly of war. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. That, that there, was a, there, was a, there had been peace in the land, if you will. That they, they had come across, and he told them to, to annihilate everything, kill everything that's breathing. Don't, 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 don't take nothing and make it yours. Don't, don't take nothing and get comfortable with it. Don't take nothing and, and, and sit down beside it, but kill everything that's in the land. And they had done partially the command. But somewhere along the way, they got tired. Somewhere along the way, they looked at that and said, well, that's not really that bad. Like somebody looked at that and said, well, she's not, she, she, she not ugly, so I don't know if we can kill that. And so they had, they had reached a point where they had sat down instead of fulfilling their mission. And God left them there to test their spiritual authenticity. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost, in the name of Jesus Christ. He left them there. He left the opposition there to test their spiritual authenticity and to test who was their king. Uh, you know, there, there, there was a time when in those days there was no king in the land and everybody did whatever they thought was right in their own eyes. He tested them to see who their king was and he tested them as proof. Proof for them to prove that he was their God, but also proof that when we are left to ourselves, we always fail. That when we are left to ourselves, House of Worship Church family, we are always found worshiping other gods. Huh? When left to ourselves, when going our own way, when doing whatever it is that we think is right, in the name of Jesus Christ, we'll always be captured by relativism and materialism and sexism and convenience. And we will always embrace the culture that we have been immersed in. Huh? Here it is. God is always displeased, always displeased when we pluck up the hedge of our peculiarity and pick and pick up convenience and commonality with the culture. Let me say that again. God is always displeased when we willingly and purposefully pluck up the hedge of our peculiarity in the name of Jesus Christ and instead we pick up the spirit of convenience and commonality with the culture. I want you to know today that for in fact, this is what Israel did and we are doing it here in the church of America, for in fact we have discarded our divine protection and set the favor and the promises of God as goods for sale as though we would really part with them. 
Mm. That's what they did. They, they took God's favor. They took God's protection. They, they took God's, God, God's love and they put it on an altar and said, we'll, we'll sell it to the highest bidder. Whoever it is that'll come by and give us enough self-validation, give us enough fine cars, give us enough money, give us enough whatever it is that I'm in need of today in the name of Jesus Christ. It's for sale. And the king of Syria came by and laid his hands upon it. Uh, uh, let's take a look real quick, if you will. Go with me to Ephesians. Can I, can, can I get amen? Can Pastor get amen? amen? Let's go to Ephesians real quick. You know the scripture, the sixth chapter of Ephesians, verse starting at verse 10. We're talking about wartime here in the name of Christ. I came to tell somebody, you got to prepare for war. You got to prepare to battle. You got to prepare to take out your enemy. You got to prepare to, in the name of Jesus Christ to, to do what it is that God has said to do. This is what the scripture says. Finally, mm, finally be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor. Somebody say full. full. Put on the full armor of God that you might be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the powers, against the world's forces of this, of, of, of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of weakness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you might be able to resist the, in the evil day and have done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having gird your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the fiery missiles of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit and with this, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. What time is it? In the name of Jesus Christ, God is telling you and I that you got to have your war clothes on. He's telling you and I where you are living, what's going on in your life. There's a devil that wants to destroy you, wants to destroy your family, wants to destroy your children, wants to destroy your dreams, your God-given, divine or divinely ordained dreams, wants to snatch from you what it is that God has placed at your disposal. But he does it with, with a scheme. He does it with a trick. It isn't necessarily obvious to your eyes, but God wants you to know today in the name of Jesus Christ. He left him here. Now you might prove who God is, who you are. And not only is there his, the left, but there is the learn. I want you to know today that we're going to have to, if we're going to make it in the world, we, 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 we're not going to find ourselves under the oppression of the king of Syria for our day. We're going to have to learn some things. Can I, can I get amen in here today in the name of Jesus Christ? You're going to, I'm going to have to learn how to fight, not just fight, but war in the spirit. We're going to have to learn how to stay on guard, how to stay focused, and how to stay intense. You're going to have to learn how to war. You got to stay intense, Doc. I'm not talking about not having any fun. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not talking about not having a good time from time to time. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying, though, is I can never let my guard down in, regard, in regards to spiritual things. Huh? I want you to know that you and I are going to have to learn how to war or be destroyed. Huh? Oh, in the name of Jesus Christ, the church, America, there's so many areas in the church, America, that have been destroyed or are being destroyed uh, because they have not been on God. They have not been diligent. They have not kept their eyes where their eyes should have been. They've been too busy looking around at the culture and seeing what the culture is doing, and no longer are they focused on the word of God and the person of Jesus Christ. No longer are they focused on the cross in the name of Jesus Christ. No longer are they focused on the shed blood of our Savior in the name of Jesus Christ? Now we're concerned about trash and trinkets and who's got the biggest church and who got more folk in the pew in the name of Christ. I want you to know today we're going to have to learn, y'all. We're going to have to learn how to war and to do the will of God, not compromising. Oh, help me, Jesus. Not negotiating. 
but proving God in your life, proving the power of God in your life. There's a test that's been in front of you right now. Oh, in the name of Jesus Christ, I'm talking to somebody in here today. There's a test in front of you right now, and the purpose of the test is for you to prove God, is to prove your king in the name of Jesus Christ. For the devil is seeking whom he might devour. So are you ready for the fight? Are you ready for the battle? Are you part of the army of God? Or have you, been, have you enlisted into service? Because God has abundancy for you, ladies and gentlemen, but we're going to have to fight to manifest it in our lives in the name of Jesus Christ. And the only way that that's going to ever happen is you got to be in the army. You got to be part of the solution in the name of Christ. And the only way for that to happen is you have to ask Christ to come into your heart, for him to come into your life, for him to be Lord and Savior over your life. And so I want you to do that tonight. If you haven't done it, I want you to do it tonight because it's the best decision you're ever going to make. You're never, ever, 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 ever going to regret it because Christ says that when you become a child of God, you walk in abundancy, you walk in prosperity prosperity, you walk in blessings, you walk in joy, and you walk in peace, not without a fight, not without a battle, but you do in the name of Jesus Christ. So the first battle is to lay, a to lay aside my own way that I might pick up Jesus Christ. So if you made that decision tonight, all you have to do is just raise your hands and say, I, I, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Lord, I want, you, I, want, I want you to have your way in my life. I want you to be Lord and Savior over my life. I tried my own way. It's not working. It's broken. It's messed up. Lord Jesus, I want to try your way because I have come to the end of myself and I understand I can no longer continue in this path that I'm in right now. If you make that decision tonight, let me know. Let me know about it. I want to send you some, uh, some information. I'm going to pray over you in the name of Jesus Christ. In fact, I'm going to pray over you right now because I'm believing God for you in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for that one right now who's, who's looking at me, who's looking at me through the airways, Lord God, that you've touched their lives and you've changed their hearts, Father. And in the name of Christ, I pray, Father, that they, that they would just move forward in you, Lord God. I pray that they would find that place they need to find. They can find encouragement, Lord God. They can be lifted up. They can move into an environment of discipleship, that someone that, that loves you, that loves them, can come in and teach them your way, Lord God. You say that in your word, Father, that those who worship you, Father, those that are your children, Lord God, you teach them the humble. You teach them their, your way, Lord God. So teach this person, these people, your way, Father, for your glory and for their good, Father. We thank you for that right now in Christ's name. Amen. Well, listen, man, thanks so much for joining us tonight. I hope you had a good time. We're not done yet talking about warfare. I promise you that because you're in a battle and uh, we're going to come back next week and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So see you next week. Have a blessed week in him. Bye-bye.